Well, Merry Christmas. Um, I hope that, uh, am I on? I hope that I'm on. Nope. Um, I hope that you all had a good day yesterday uh, for Christmas. Um, I hope that you uh, were able to spend time with family. I know that uh, different people um, experience Christmas differently. Sometimes it's, it's sad, you know, the first Christmas without somebody or that sort of thing. But I uh, hope you had some time with family and friends. Hopefully you ate some good food. Um, maybe you even got a present or two. Um, I also hope uh, that as I've been saying here uh, for a couple weeks, that you were able to create some space this Christmas in your life to kind of pause and stop and, and uh, be with Jesus. If you haven't had a chance to do that, if you feel like we got to December 26th and you can finally just breathe, um, then I hope we still have room or we still have a time to create some of that space. Uh, today, that's basically what I want to talk about, the kind of post-Christmas implications. Uh, I also want to explain why on earth we lit the Advent candles uh, on the 26th, as you may have wondered, like, I thought that was supposed to happen before Christmas, but um, I think there's two kinds of people when it comes to kind of what you do, do after Christmas is over. Uh, there's some of you who yesterday you had the, you were holding the trash bag, and like, as things were becoming a mess, you were putting that away, and then as presents were done, you put them away, and then today or yesterday or tomorrow, you're going to put the tree away, get these decorations out of my house, and let me just get back to, to normal life. Then there's the other group uh, of people, uh, which includes my wife, um, who say winter is a little bit boring and sad and dark, and I like decorations, so let's just keep them up for a little while longer, right? Like, we might as well spruce this place up. And those people uh, get to about mid-February or even early March. And, and you, open, you open the door to your house, and a slight winter breeze comes in, and there's like 4,000 more needles on the floor underneath that Christmas tree, right? Like, the, the, it's brown, it's brittle, um, it's, it's barely there, and you're like, finally, I got it. This is a fire hazard at this point, you know? I need to get this thing, get this thing out of here. And so the question I want to ask today is basically, like, what, what on earth do we do uh, with the incarnate Son of God, Jesus, kind of post-Christmas? Kind of how do we respond after Christmas to the Christmas story? Um, I'm going to try to get at this from uh, what I think is a pretty interesting uh, framework. And this comes from the gospel author, John, which I've been saying for a while now. He's like a, inspired by the Holy Spirit. He's a super interesting author. And so I think intentionally, uh, John, in the first chapter and a half of his gospel, basically gave us the framework for the entire Bible in one and a half chapters. Let me, let me see if I can convince you, okay? John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. Well, that clearly sounds like it's going back to Genesis, uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Soon after that, uh, and we're not going to go into it today, uh, he introduces this guy named John the Baptist. You've heard of him, I'm guessing. Uh, and John the Baptist is kind of this summary figure who kind of encapsulates this whole idea of Israel and the prophets and the Old Testament all summed up in one person. And then when it gets to John 1.14, uh, we read the verse uh, that I talked about on Friday night, uh, the word became flesh and put up a tent uh, among us. The word became flesh and put up a tent among us. That's Christmas, that's the incarnation, that's, that's just what we talked about yesterday. Then, and I'll skip the rest of John chapter 1, uh, but there's this really interesting story that might seem very different uh, in the beginning of John chapter 2. Uh, John chapter 2 starts with this story about Jesus uh, at a wedding, and you might, you might know this story. He uh, takes uh, water and turns this water into wine at the wedding, at the wedding celebration. And I think, and a lot of other people uh, that think about this kind of stuff think, that that is pointing towards the wedding uh, supper of the Lamb and this idea of a, a great party of full rejoicing and goodness uh, that, that, as a matter of fact, goes on and on forever and even, even seems in the, in the story in John chapter 2 to get better as it goes, right? And so we find ourselves currently situated in John chapters you know, 1 and the first half of 2, uh, we're kind of 
right there, as you can see on the screen, uh, kind of in between the word became flesh and tabernacled among us, and not quite at, you know, here's this eternal party that's going to go on forever. And so the question is, what do we do now? Or you could say, when do we put these Christmas decorations away? Right, that's the question we want to get at today. Um, I'm going to start uh, John chapter 1, verse uh, 19. We're going to kind of get into this. Uh, it says this, John, uh, Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 19. This is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Right, John the Baptist, who, who are you? Uh, he confessed, he did not de- deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. I am not the Christ. And this is today's first point. Um, Post-Christmas, it's really, really important for us all to confess that we are not the Christ. We are not the Christ. Uh, John uh, was a pretty awesome guy, but he very clearly said that he was not Jesus. He was not the uh, Messiah, the kind of golden-haired, bronze-skinned savior of the universe. Like, that was not John the Baptist. That job only belongs to Jesus. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'll just speak from my own life. Uh, This is kind of hard for me. And I put a picture of my wife up there, and I checked with her ahead of time. Uh, It's hard for her, too, because it's sometimes very tempting to eliminate Jesus from the equation and place ourselves as the savior for other people. This is called the Messiah complex. And the Messiah complex is this idea that maybe I want, you know, some glory for myself. Maybe I want to look like I'm more put together than everybody else. So all of a sudden, instead of saying that I'm going to point them to Jesus, the actual Messiah, I try to take that place and take on the role of savior for other people. (laughs) Let me just tell you from experience this is not a good idea. Not a good idea. Here's two reasons why. First, um, this is precisely how we get burnt out. This is precisely how we get burnt out. Um, I think there are a lot of people going through life feeling weary, feeling exhausted because we just can't do enough for other people. We can't solve their problems the way we want to. We can't jump into their lives and just fix things the way we want to be able to fix things. And the reality is that we're just people. Like, we're finite created beings of God. Uh, There already was a, a, a person and God who hung on the cross and died to provide freedom and, and salvation for people, but it's not you and it's not me. And so we can take a deep breath. You can kind of sleep a little more. You can kind of take that weight off of your shoulders. I can try to take that weight off of my shoulders and say that we're not the Messiah, I'm not the Christ, let that job to him, that's not my role. For two, um, this problem, this Messiah complex sort of problem, is why I think a whole lot of people are very turned off by the church. Because sometimes, whether we mean to or not, we put out out this this, um, posture or this impression that we are somehow, you know, the savior of the universe, right? That we are that, that thing. And then people turn around and they say, well, you're going you're gonna to posture or present yourself like you're so good, but I know the inside of your life. Like, I know the family problems you have. I know the whatever, whatever, whatever. Like, instead of saying, as a church, that we are a whole bunch of saviors, we should be saying we are a whole bunch of hypocrites in need of a savior, even for those of us within, within the church. And so even when we're doing good uh, ministry-oriented things, right? Like if we're handing out soup to people who are hungry, if we're singing really great worship music from up here, if we're counseling with people, if we're whatever it is that we're doing that is like a good ministry-oriented thing, even when we're doing those things, we need to realize right smack dab in the middle of that, I am not the Christ. That, that weight is not on, on me. Jesus himself said about John the Baptist, he said, among those born of a woman, there's nobody greater than John the Baptist. And even John the Baptist said, I am not the Christ. (laughs) So we got to be awfully careful what we're doing. Um, The way we do this, the way the church and the Bible has always described that we're supposed to do this is through the act of confession. Through the act of confession. 
Um, if we are not continually examining ourselves, or, or, or better yet, better said, asking the Holy Spirit to examine our hearts and find places where we are not living out, where we are living out our lives opposite from what Jesus would want, and we're confessing those things, let me put it this way. <laughs> I don't think any of you have a t-shirt in your drawer that says, I am the Christ. And you're going around wearing this t-shirt like, hey, check me out. We're, we, we don't do, like, of course we don't do that. But if we're not confessing, if that's not a regular practice of our lives, then it subtly creeps in that we might be tempted to think that we are the Messiah, that we are the Christ, right? Confession is literally saying, here are the ways that I am not the Christ because I have things to confess out of my own life. Um, so we need to confess, uh, you need to confess, I need to confess, we are not, we are not the Christ. However, uh, that confession should not leave us paralyzed. So I think there's, there's two sides of a kind of balance that I'm working with here. One side is that we want to go around and we want to tell people, like, we're not the Christ. Jesus died on the cross. He's the salvation, not me. We want to do that kind of thing. But on the far other side of the spectrum, you might think, well, then I'm just kind of paralyzed. Like, you want me to go around wearing a shirt that says, I am not the Christ. You know, like, here's, here's an interesting thought. Um, John 15, uh, there's a passage about the vine and the branches. And in there, it says, uh, uh, Jesus says, uh, apart from me, you can do nothing. I heard it said by somebody else. I thought this was real interesting. The issue, though, is if we do nothing, it'll probably be apart from him. Right? Like, apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you do nothing, it'll probably be apart from, from God's work in your life. And so we shouldn't be paralyzed, but we can't also kind of portray this idea that we are the Savior, that we are the Christ. So what do we do? Let's go back to John chapter 1. Uh, I'm at verse uh, 32 now, if you're reading along with us here. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 32. And John bore witness, uh, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him, that is, on Jesus. Uh, I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And this is our key sentence for the rest of our time today. Um, and I've seen and I've borne witness that this is the Son of God. And I've seen and I've borne witness that this is the Son of God. It's kind of interesting, right? Like Christmas, uh, you put out all the decorations. And like I talked about last week, the lights are kind of this, this indication that Jesus is the light. Right? You might have a little nativity set in your house, basically saying Jesus is the Son of God. And, and the decorations, the Christmas decorations, they witness to the fact that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So when do we take them down, or, or what do we do about this idea of taking down those Christmas decorations? Um, like I said, I'd like to spend the rest of our time examining this sentence uh, where John the Baptist says of Jesus, I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Let me mention two things. Uh, first, notice that, that John has seen Jesus. John has seen Jesus. Um, he looks at Jesus and he examines him. Now at Christmas time, uh, and if you have that nativity in your, part of your decorations, uh, in there somewhere is the baby Jesus. And what I found um, is that most everybody likes to look at babies. I like to y'all. I get I get some flack sometimes because I say that sometimes little babies look like aliens. But <laughs> when they get to be about two or so, right? Like everybody likes to look at those little kids at, the, at those little babies. And I think I think the reason why we like to look at babies is this: um, they are full of potential, right? Like every time you look at a little baby, you think. What could this life become? Like, it hasn't yet, uh, hopefully, been, been scarred by the problems, by the bumps and bruises of life yet. And so it's kind of this full potential of, like, here's a life, what can that life become? I've, we've had the joy uh, this, this couple, last couple days. Uh, my brother and his wife are in town, uh, Ben and Bailey, and their new three-month-old son named Jonas. So this is my, my nephew, Jonas. He's three months old. 
And when we look at Jonas, we're like, oh, he's a, a cute, kind of like really awesome baby. And what is he going to, like, despite his father, uh, <laughs> despite his father, what is this baby going to become? Like, that's kind of the question. But we all know, like, if, if you're an adult in this room, what you know is that you never actually became fully the potential that you had. Right? Like, this side of eternity, all of us have experienced, we've witnessed to this idea of, like, the bumps and bruises of a life, and that's forced us to live in ways that didn't reach our fullest potential of what we really wish we would be. Right? Like, all of us, I think, at some level, you know, sometimes lay, lay down with our head on the pillow and think, boy, I just wish this life was a little bit better than what it actually looks like right now. <clears throat> but Jesus, uh, and this is why John said you, you should look and you should try to see Jesus, because Jesus is different. And, and I want you, I'm asking you to think this through. Like, Jesus is the only individual who actually lived to fully become precisely what his potential actually was. Like, all the rest of us were influenced sinfully uh, by the bumps and bruises of our life, but Jesus became fully who he was intended to become. Which, so interestingly, was the, the king of the universe and the savior of the world, as well as a, a person who died on a cross. Like, he fully did what he was supposed to do. He's such a, he's such a fascinating individual because... He fully embodied, right, John 1, 14, uh, that Cam just read. He fully embodied grace and truth. He put them smack dab together. He was, and I want you to, I ask you to think this through. I think Jesus was the most intelligent human ever on earth. Like, not a super duper scientist, you know. I think Jesus was the most intelligent, like, he most, he best knew the human condition like the human life experience and how to live that life experience well. And so John says here that we need to see him. We need to look at Jesus. And so what we're going to do, uh, and what I plan to do as long as God has me as the pastor of Kish, is every year about uh, the new year till about Easter, is we're just going to take a whole bunch of time and keep on looking at Jesus. Because he's really impressive, and he, it's, it's like inexhaustible how interesting and helpful and good uh, his, his, he is. And so uh, we'll be doing a sermon series uh, starting about mid-January-ish uh, up until Easter, uh, looking at Jesus, what can he teach us, how can he help us, all this kind of stuff. Um, second, uh, we get to bear witness that Jesus is the Son of God. We get to bear witness. So John said, I've seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God, and we get to bear witness Right, post-Christmas, we can bear witness that Jesus is the Son of God. How do we do that? Um, I'm asking you to set aside, like when you think of the word witness in the church, kind of religious context, I'm asking you to set that, that thought aside for a minute, and I want to ask the question of what on earth is a witness? Like when you hear that somebody is a witness, like what, what do you picture? What is that? And I think um, a good place to start is like a, like a trial or like a, a, a scene, right? Maybe you're thinking, a few of you are the legal types. You're thinking, like, I, I witnessed this person sign their signature, so I signed and said, I'm a witness of that. But most often, I think for a lot of us, it makes a, a lot of sense in our brains to say, when someone is a witness, that means they saw something, right? Like they saw something rel related to a crime or related to a situation. Now they're going to testify in court, and they're going to say what they saw or what they didn't say, and they're going to speak as a witness of that thing. So to put it super simply, a witness is literally someone who sees something and then they respond in their actions or their words to what they saw. It's super simple. Don't got to make it crazy complex. That's a witness. All right, let's go to a trial. Um, Luke chapter 22, uh, there's a trial. There's a trial in Luke uh, chapter 22. It's a big, long chapter. So we're down in like the 60s, I think verse 68 or 67, something like that. Um, let me set the scene of the trial, right? So there's these uh, religious leaders, these Jewish religious leaders, and they uh, are very upset with this guy named Jesus. And the reason they're upset with Jesus is because they're, they're claiming, they're, they're saying, 
that this guy Jesus is walking around and he's doing the kinds of things that a person should not be able to do. Right? Like he's healing people. Um, he's forgiving people. And only, we, we know, we're good Jews. We know only God forgives people. So a person can't be doing that. He's doing ministry like outside of the temple. And it's like, no, no, no. That's not supposed, how it's supposed to work. Like God is just in the temple. You're not supposed to be gallivanting around doing good things outside of this temple. Matter of fact, this Jesus guy is even claiming that he's the son of God. And these folks are like, that, that just can't be. That's just, that can't be right. So they, they, they catch him and they take him to a trial. Here's what it says in the trial. So uh, we're at Luke chapter 22, uh, verse 67. They say, if you are the Christ, that means the Messiah or the Savior, right? Like we're not the Christ, but if he's the Christ, uh, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will not believe. And if I ask you, you will not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So they said, like, now get this, get this in, in, in relation to where we're at today. Uh, so they, said, they all said, are you the Son of God then? Remember, this is precisely what John the Baptist is saying. I'm a witness to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. Now we're at the trial, and they're saying, are you the Son of God then? And he, that's, that's Jesus, uh, said to them, you say that I am. Okay? Then they say, well, what further testimony do we need? We've heard it, we've heard it ourselves from his own lips. Right? Like, we don't need any further testimony. We heard it from his own lips. You see, at Jesus' trial, they're asking the exact same question of John the Baptist. Is Jesus the Son of God Yes or no? Jesus, in so many words, basically says, yes, I am the Son of God. Um, the religious leaders say, and, and this is interesting uh, Greek tidbit here, they say, if you, depending on the translation you have, what further testimony do we need? Really, the word there, the Greek word there for testimony is witness. What they're saying is, what further witness do we need? Right? Like, Jesus himself said he's the Son of God, certainly no human being walking this earth can be the son of God, so we don't need any, there's no need for any further witnesses. Like, we got enough, like, he said it, that's it. <clears throat> you could think of this as basically <laughs> Christmas on trial, right? So Chris, the, the idea of Christmas, which we've been talking about and you've been thinking about for probably years, is the idea that God became flesh, the son of God in the person of Jesus. And Christmas is on trial because they're saying, are you the son of God? And so they put this whole idea of Christmas on trial. And I think there's a lot of people nowadays, a lot of Christians nowadays, who are really like this idea of, oh, the culture is really taking, trying to take Jesus out of Christmas. We're trying to, to remove Jesus from Christmas. It's this idea of putting Christmas on trial. <clears throat> Back to our original question. <laughs> Should you take your Christmas decorations down, like get rid of the tree before it gets all dried out and needles dropping everywhere, or should you leave it up? To be 100% honest with you, I, I could absolutely care less <laughs> what you do with your Christmas decorations. Like, that's fine, I, no big deal. The question, though, is are we being witnesses to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God? Let's go back to the trial. So, uh, as you all know, uh, at this trial, they find Jesus basically guilty, and they kill him, right? They kill him. Like, like one witness, the voice of himself was enough. He says he's the son of God. We don't need any other witnesses. Put him on the cross. And it seems like Christmas is dead, right? Like Christmas is all tucked into the tomb. Like he's not the son of God. That can't be the case. Put it in the tomb. Until... Uh, Three days later, the tomb is empty. And you get these really awesome accounts. In, in all four of the Gospels, they all mention how these women went there early that Sunday morning, and it literally says they witnessed, they were witnesses of the fact that the tomb was empty. So they didn't, remember back when they didn't need any more witnesses? Well, now they got them. And they witnessed to the fact that the tomb was empty and that if Jesus, and I've said this before and I'll say it again, we really have to wrestle with, do we believe that Jesus 
physically came out of the tomb alive on Easter Sunday. Because if you believe that, and Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15, if you believe that, then that changes absolutely everything. That changes, I think, how we see Christmas. Because If he is the Son of God, that's the claim of Christmas, then if he can come out of the tomb alive, then that, that confirms. Like, the trial, we don't need the trial. Like, it's true. He is the Son of God. And so uh, the women were witnesses to Jesus' life after the resurrection, and then the disciples were witnesses of that same life after the resurrection. And then in this really cool passage that I'm guessing you might know uh, from Acts uh, chapter 1, I think it is, uh, there Jesus is about to ascend into glory, and what he says is, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Right? Like, like this idea of the witnesses of that is going to expand outward uh, from then on. So where does this leave us? Like we're 2,000 years since then. We're to be witnesses. What do we do with our Christmas decorations? All this kind of stuff. So I had a uh, conversation with uh, PD a couple weeks ago. And that meant I had to bring out that picture again. <clears throat> as many times as I can. I spent like 20 minutes looking through my old emails to find that picture. Um, I had this conversation. We were talking about something completely separate from this. Uh, we were talking about church ministry kind of things, and we were saying this idea was um, kind of how do we get people to change and get on board with new or different things. And what he said to me was sometimes what we all need if we're going to change or do something different or be excited about something is we just need an example. Like, we need to see somebody do a thing, and then it's like, okay, oh, I get it. That's, that's what you're talking about. Here's an example. Okay, I can now do that kind of thing or whatever it is. And like I said, he was talking about, but in my brain, this, like, light bulb went on, and I thought, this is exactly it. This is exactly it. Because the message of Jesus is basically is, is something like this. God has always had a tremendous love for his people, right, for, for people, He's always loved, loved people, but it's like we couldn't get it, you know? Like, he loves, and we're just like, no, you can't love us. He loves you, you can't. So he sends Jesus as the example of what God's heart is for, his, for people, right? of how God loves people. Like, Jesus is that in flesh in an example form, so we can be like, okay, now I can see it. I can get it. Like that, I can wrap my hands around, this makes sense to me, right? You can see Jesus living, sacrificing being unified with God, creating community, helping, all, serving, all this kind of stuff. And we're like, okay, that makes more sense. <clears throat> um, and I think this is tied to the idea of what it means to be a witness. But the issue is, I think, that so many of us, we've gone through our lives. Remember, a witness, the definition is people who saw certain things and then talk and act in ways that respond to what we saw. The issue is that a lot of us have seen a lot of other things that are not of God, right? Like some of us have seen, you know, family relationships that have been super unhealthy. And so we talk and we live in response to that. Some of us have seen people who use anger as like a method to manipulate and control other people. And so we live as witnesses to that kind of a truth. We, we talk and we act in ways that respond to that. Some of us have witnessed people who thought the way to happiness is to get as much money as you possibly get. So we talk and live as witnesses to that kind of truth. So all of us struggle because of the bumps and bruises and, and things of life. We struggle because we live as witnesses. We live as witnesses to this reality that is not actually, actually the truth. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to try to do this without <clears throat> getting emotional. On the other hand, I want you to think for a second of why is it that you were drawn to Jesus at the beginning of your life? Like, what did you see or, or, or what, what was the reality in your life that drew you to be excited to become a Christian? And I don't know what that was for all of you, but I think for a whole bunch of us, it was some individual who, through their life and actions, was an example that showed off the kind of thing, not perfectly, the kind of thing that Jesus 
would, would, th- th- this, this alternate view that it's not anger or power or whatever that helps us get what we want. It's this alternate thing. And I know for me, it's, it's my mom. And what happens is, like, she'll, she'll be the first to say she's not perfect, all that kind of stuff. But what happens is we see somebody and they care about us, they sacrificially love, they do whatever, whatever it is that they do that communicates, right, not perfectly, communicates this kind of love that is wrapped up in, in the way God wants us to care for and love other people, right? They're looking to Jesus, they're seeing him, and they're being a witness to that truth in their lives, and it changes other people because you see that, right? And so, I guess basically what I'm saying is this. Uh, everybody here, it takes absolutely no courage to condemn the world for all of its problems. Like that takes hardly any courage at all. It doesn't take very much to complain and to whine about this world is going downhill, da 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 da, got it, yep. It takes no courage. What it takes courage to do is for us to say, <laughs> there's all these narratives out in the world, like, you know, I could live my life based on this truth or this truth or this truth. I could say this is reality. Or I could say Jesus came out of the tomb alive. Christmas is true. That's the reality. And I can live as a witness to that. And I think there's a plenty of opportunities if we're willing to open ourselves up to living that kind of witness. There's plenty of opportunities to be creative in it. And so, for example, um, New Year's is, is a time that a lot of us do this, but there's space to say something like, I want to be a witness to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God with my money, right? Or I want to be a witness to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God in my family relationships. Like, I want, when people see how I interact with each other, I want them to see that I'm looking at Jesus, he's transforming me, and they can see that, that happening in me. Like, sometimes, <laughs> the deal is this, people just need an example. They just need an example. And the opportunity for the church like, yeah, the world's crazy. Got it, you know? People are lonely. Yep, all that kind of stuff. Like, to me, that's just more and more opportunities that we have to witness to the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. And so, I, like I said, I, I really don't care at all when you put your stinking uh, Christmas decorations away. Like, I have no, I have no thing in that, that fight at all. But I do think that if we're going to live kind of post-Christmas as Christians here in this world, we... First off, confess, I'm not the Son of God. Like, I'm not the Christ. So you don't have all the weight of the world on you, number one. Number two, then we look to Jesus. Like, if you're not looking to Jesus, then you're just going to be living out of all, or you're going to be a witness of all the stories that you know in your own life. And so you're not in the Word, if you're not praying, like, how are you going to be a witness to something if you're not, if you weren't there at the scene of the event? Like, you, you can't do that. But then number three, I think there's all sorts of opportunities. Like you can get all kinds of creative with how it is that you're going to live as a witness to the truth of, of Jesus. Um, we're going to close uh, in a song uh, today. It's a little uh, different for us, not probably familiar to you. Um, it's called Behold uh, the Lamb of God. This song is from a concert by this guy named Andrew Peterson uh, that has really been encouraging to me. Uh, this Christmas season. And the idea of the song is basically, uh, look, <laughs> behold, behold, there he is, the Son of God. Um, and we look at him, and that transforms us, and then we get the opportunity to be, to be witnesses um, of him. So I'm going to ask them to come up. I'm going to pray. Uh, we'll finish with that song. Um, I just encourage you, just please hear this as a message of not oppressive burden on your shoulders, but almost like this is a great thing that we have the opportunity to do. And be creative, like be a witness in all sorts of ways. I purposely didn't use that word to mean like witness to people with words, although that's included. Like, you know, lots of things. All right, let me pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you um, for your son, for Jesus, who is the Savior. Um, We thank you that he uh, came and lived and died to welcome us into just uh, joy and depth and intimacy, uh, to welcome us into even, even responsibility. If there's people who feel like their life is worthless and there's nothing to do, um, 
that we have this opportunity, uh, and we don't have to be perfect at it, but we can strive towards it, we can put effort into it, this opportunity to live as witnesses, to find some people who maybe are lonely, who are sad, uh, find some people who don't know about you, uh, promote um, the, the, the actual reality that Jesus is the Son of God, and that he came to take away the sins of the world, to welcome us into relationship. And I just pray, Lord, that Kish is a place where, failed as we are, uh, there'd be a whole bunch of examples for people to see um, your goodness and your love through, through our lives. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.